we support students and student organizations to learn more about the ideas of liberty by providing education resources and trainings to help them elevate the quality of their activism and and whatever activities they are undertaking to uh, spread the ideas of uh, free markets tolerance um, restricted small gov government and uh, basically more power in the hands of people away from um, the all powerful state and their cronies um as if if you are a student studying in uh, in a university or just somebody generally interested in the ideas of liberty uh, i i would highly encourage you to check out our uh, um, mooc uh, a small mooc that we've launched it's called liberty 101 it's in association with uh, learn liberty which is um which is a project of institute for humane studies in the in the united, united states uh, it's a short course a really short course uh, with the four sessions each on philosophy economics and law uh if you if you if you want a more rigorous learning experience i would highly recommend you to apply for our local coordinator program the program has a four week long academic training that discusses the philosophy of liberty and various approaches um uh, uh, of justifying the need for more liberty along with the leadership training to help you uh, organize a student a uh, student group or you know organize people in your community to better understand the ideas of liberty um so today we have with us uh, shashank mehra shashank is a software engineer uh, and he has been um, i mean he he is a he he, he blogs uh, on economics and finance and he he blogs at uh, in libertarians um, a popular uh, group on, among pro liberty individuals in india who, that supports um, uh, individual rights uh, and uh, is essentially a libertarian uh, group uh, at the forefront of uh, the pro liberty movement in india and uh, i find his views to be very uh, interesting on um, net neutrality he's made a he's been making a very strong case for why uh, net neutrality legislation legislation leg legislation uh, from the government isn't really important to save the internet um i'll hand over the mic to uh, shank now who you've come who we've all come here to listen to and uh, yeah I, i he can probably enlighten us more on why we don't need a government uh, in interference to ensure net neutrality as an inviolable principle uh, so shank if you uh, i mean you can go ahead i need to uh, share shares need to share screen i don't have the uh okay fine uh, uh yeah. yeah i'll just do, yeah yeah i'll just do that okay uh just can you guys see the screen yes so uh, your audio is perfect yeah Hello, hello everyone. I am Shashank Mehra. I am an alumni from Bilspilani, and I work as a software developer. I study economics as a hobby, and full disclosure, my thoughts usually align with the uh, Austrian school of economics. Uh, and I am a libertarian, uh, but but none of that matters. We are here today to understand net neutrality, its origins, and what all it entails. and why and understand why the idea itself is flawed i will be contrasting the idea of net neutrality with the idea of optimality and highlight the economic forces responsible for the spread of the internet for the greater part of this presentation i will not be be concentrating on facebook's free basics free basics is just a product you can argue that it must be banned for various reasons but if you are arguing that it must be banned for uh, on the basis of its violations of net neutrality Uh, you are doing a great disservice to internet freedom so i will just be concentrating on neutrality for now and i would request you to separate the two topics out tri didn't ask whether free basics should be banned or not they asked whether packages which commit price discrimination should be allowed or not zero plans like airtel zero and free basics are one way to do that so certainly if price discrimination is allowed uh, then free basics will be effectively banned but so will a lot of other types of offerings uh, which have existed in the past and exist today 
we have air cells, Wikipedia Zero, cheap WhatsApp packs, cheap Twitter packs, etc. They all exist today and they won't exist if differential pricing is banned across the board. So with that in mind, uh, let's go to net neutrality. I must admit that uh, when net neutrality debate came to India, I was surprised uh, at the way it came the way it became an issue here, uh, because in the United States, uh, the debate on net neutrality was on fast lanes and throttling. And I had some issues with net neutrality even then, but, uh, and we'll get to that in a bit. But in India, uh, when it was argued that uh, packages like Airtel Zero should be disallowed because they violated net neutrality, I was I immediately thought that, uh, like, how is this related to net neutrality? And net neutrality was presented internationally as a networking concept. But zero plans don't seem to require any changes in networks. Uh, it, it, it is simply sponsored services. Instead of uh, consumer paying individually, his access was being paid uh, for in bulk by services who opted in the plan, into the plan. Uh, and naturally, those services would like to pay only for the access to for the access to their sites. So other sites would have to be blocked. Seemed like something you've done in the past. If you remember, uh, you know, BlackBerry packages. Uh, no fast lanes configuration came into the picture. No change in network architecture was being argued for. So it was a bit confusing for me uh, because I thought that net neutrality was a concept related to best effort principle, uh, which actually is a working concept. Uh, and I realized that net neutrality advocates are more concerned about economical aspects than they are worried about technical aspects. Uh, that the core of the argument lies in economics rather than the technology involved in the internet. And you can really drive this point home by considering that IETF, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, does not take any stance on net neutrality, especially destination neutrality, which zero services and fast lanes violate. Instead, I quote, uh, net neutrality is an economic and legal issue. They are more concerned with providing the right building blocks to allow network operators to manage their network effectively, uh, which is where the concept of application neutrality comes in, like throttling of P2P traffic. So there are a lot of different types of violations of net neutrality possible, and therefore we must look at its origins and its definitions as the debate has evolved in the, over the past decade. Although net neutrality as a concept was used in various conferences of internet law, uh, the concept entered academia first through, the, through a paper by uh, a law professor, Tim Wu. Uh, back then, he didn't put a definition on net neutrality. Instead, he called it a concrete expression of a system of belief about innovation. Uh, he writes, speaking very generally, adherents view the innovation process as a survival of the fittest competition among developers of new technologies. They are suspicious of models of development that might best control uh, in any initial prospect holder, private or public, who is expected to direct the optimal path of innovation, minimizing the excesses of innovative competition. The suspicion arises from the belief that the uh, most promising path of development is difficult to predict in advance, and the argument that any single prospect holder will suffer from cognitive biases. Uh, that make it unlikely to come to the right decision despite best in, in intentions. Now this is quite vague if you ask me and, uh, and also contradictory to the policies that net neutralists uh, advocate. And we will get into that, why it, get into it, uh, why it is contradictory, but it is easy to see that it is a general tendency rather than a strict demand. So naturally different definitions of net neutrality have cropped up over the years when academia started to take the concept seriously, uh, depending on the sorts of restrictions the particular advocate wanted to impose. Now, uh, these are some of the definitions which are quite common. Uh, strict net neutrality uh, definition is that net neutrality prohibits internet service providers from speeding up, slowing down, or blocking internet traffic based on its source, ownership, or, or destination. Definition two is that net neutrality usually mean, uh, means that uh, broadband service providers charge customers, uh, consumers only once for internet access, 
do, do not favor one content provider over another and do not charge content providers for sending information over broadband lines to end users. And there's of course uh, my favorite Tim Berners-Lee's definition. Uh, if I pay to connect to the net with a certain quality of service and you pay to connect with that or greater quality of service, then we can communicate at that level. That is all. It is up to ISPs to make sure that they interoperate so that that happens. I believe uh, that Tim Berners-Lee's definition is the most lenient and the most accurate in terms of how internet uh, looks or should look from a consumer's perspective. Uh, it does not talk about uh, what the ISP can and cannot do, but rather talks about what the ISP should provide when they are offering access to the internet. And how ISPs wish to go about in doing that is entirely up to them. Uh, the first two definitions are more like uh, what the ISPs can and cannot do in hopes to satisfy the third definition and perhaps more resulting in them being more strict definitions. Net neutrality violations uh, can be considered in two dimensions, uh, the pricing regime and the networking regime. Uh, now, you, now, based on how people usually think internet works, they claim that we should have strict net neutrality, that networking regime should be uh, capacity only, and that ISPs should engineer or manage their network, uh, should not engineer or manage their network any more than maintaining you know, dump pipes. And that pricing regime should be one-sided because a content provider like Facebook already pays its own ISP for access to the internet. The end users, ISP, should only charge the end user for, for the access to the internet and not charge the content provider again. In India, the current debate is in the pricing dimension. In the United States, uh, the debate was in both dimensions. If you notice, the status quo is already uh, in the managed network category. Uh, it is not strictly neutral. Uh, I'll, uh, we'll get to uh, the, the violations of net, strict net neutrality a bit later. And uh, in various countries and places, there are already cheap plans for certain services. So net is not neutral and it is still functioning. Uh, to understand why it is not neutral, uh, we will have to get into technical and economical aspects of uh, networking. But keep in mind that these two are, these are two different dimensions. Uh, so there are various combinations possible. Uh, you can have uh, managed networks which uh, don't charge content providers and show no price discrimination. Uh, you can also have capacity. Uh, you can also have capacity-only networks uh, with no fast lanes or QoS, but still provide special packages like uh, zero services. One second. Internet is used by uh, a lot of people every day, yet few realize how, what true beauty it is. Uh, it is not because it is a communication medium that surpasses previous kinds of communication in terms of reachability. We have always improved reachability and technology has always been progressing. And internet is not perfect yet either. Only 40 to 50 percent of the world population is online and not all of them have high speed broadbands. We should remember that before we pass regulations which could potentially inhibit capital flow into this industry. But the true beauty of uh, the internet lies in how, how it came to exist in such a large scale and uh, continues to exist and expand. Uh, there isn't a central governing authority that de decides which network to connect to and where or to lay down connection. Uh, there is no central authority deciding on routing. Each network works its best to provide, uh, to, to works its best to route traffic to the IP address for which it is intended to. Uh, it is not just a set of pipes, it is quite a bit of optimization. There is quite a bit of optimization in the background where each network strives uh, to best satisfy the demands of the networks that directly connect to it. That such an arrangement has come about in such a large scale should invite an economic study in itself as to what economic forces have governed to make it so. I think the problem that most people have, uh, uh, the, I think the problem is that most people have an incorrect understanding of what internet is and how it works. 
people usually think that there is an internet as a cohesive entity like an ocean and then there is an ISP which provides access to the internet at a certain bandwidth and that everyone else does the same thing uh, that they have their own ISP uh, they connect to and uh, that ISP provides access to internet. The problem with thinking about internet this way is that we have abstracted out everything that actually interconnects the ISP. We start to think of internet as an outside entity. So when we talk about uh, routing of packets, we don't think of routing as a concept further than our local ISP. Take Tim Berners-Lee's definition of net neutrality. He says that ISPs must interconnect and interoperate to make sure that net neutrality is maintained and that in the past they have shown that they are capable of doing that. But there are various economic forces which we will get into, uh, which are involved in pushing ISPs uh, into doing this. These economic forces could have different implications than neutrality for different situations. The model that you see on the screen shows three ISP tiers. There isn't an official demarcation between the tiers. Basically, all ISPs uh, which are in a particular tier have a settlement free interconnection with each other. Uh, that means that uh, these ISPs don't uh, charge each other for transit, they just peer without uh, charging each other. Whether that happens depends on your bargaining power and it is usually calculated by usage. So if two ISPs are interconnected and both use each other to the same extent then they don't have any settlements with each other. If you are an ISP and you want your, to increase your bargaining power, you might want to decrease traffic that goes out of your network or you might want to increase how much traffic you can route through your network. In either case, you need to expand your network and its routing capability. A purely tier 1 network will not pay anyone for IP transit because they are so huge uh, that they are the ones doing more heavy lifting than other tier ISPs. So they appear with ISPs of the similar level. Of course, they are not free riding on other ISPs. Firstly, they have huge amounts of capital invested, especially in such a way that they are able to be used by other ISPs. Simply having a big network does not mean uh, that you have a bar bargaining power. They don't blindly invest capital. You need to uh, create networks which provide more usage to other ISPs compared to how much you use those other ISPs. Secondly, we, we, we can see that this is an entrepreneurial task. There isn't a blueprint for the internet because there isn't a predetermined usage pattern known. Uh, which investment is going to give you more bargaining power is not known from the start. So networks expand and try to increase their bargaining power. And in some cases, when a network thinks that it has more bargaining power than its peer, uh, in worst case, it can even threaten DPR. And that threat can materialize. Depearing threats are given in hopes that other networks consumers and peers won't be hurt by, will be hurt more by the decision than your own consumers and peers, which may eventually conclude the negotiations in your favor. Of course, there can be more parameters involved, like how critical is that connection and if other alternatives are available. But it is negotiations that basically decide who peers with whom and who pays for transit. Now these tiers are not exactly defined. There isn't a strict demarcation that usually that divides them. Usually big ISPs uh, peer with other big ISPs and charge transit from uh, other smaller ISPs. I'm using big and small in terms of how much the networks are used. Thirdly, uh, there is of course maintenance cost. You need to maintain your network so that it provides access to your peers and consumers. Tier 3 ISPs usually do not peer. Uh, they are not uh, spread wide uh, to do so. They usually buy transits from uh, one or more tier 2 ISP and, uh, and then in charge transit from end users. End users are not routing traffic anywhere, so they are not in networking services. So they end up paying for the whole thing. As far as tier 1 and tier 2 networks are concerned, for each network, there is a huge economic incentive to be utilized more by others than utilize other tra network traffic. And your routing setup will depend a lot on this. 
the more efficiently you can utilize your network, the more you can bargain for peering rather than transit. Uh, at the end of the day, all individual networks, no matter how their size, have a drive to satisfy the consumer networks that connect to it. The more you are able to satisfy, the more bargaining power uh, you get. From the perspective of individual network, you would like to peer or connect to those networks which allow you to communicate with as many users as possible. And uh, the other network would like to do the same thing. Each individual network tries to optimize its routing as much as possible. And this way, we have the whole internet forming because of these economic incentives. This, I believe, is the true beauty of the internet. Not, that, uh, not just that it allows us to uh, transit data over heterogeneous networks but the way it has developed without a central plan on dictating where, uh, where all to spread uh, the network uh, uh, or a central designer designing the topology. No network engineer would have designed this. There is simply too many economic calculations to be done to figure out how to use scarce resources to provide networks as best as possible. People love the open aspect of the internet, and I love that too, but it is important to remember what made internet so open, especially when economic forces are involved, especially which economic forces are responsible. I think both of these aspects are important. We should not downplay the importance of autonomy over your network. Even if there are big ISPs which scare you, uh, you should be free to optimize your network to provide best experience to the people uh, that connect to your network. Economic forces which reward such behavior must be left free. Control over such economic forces will have a similar effect as price control will have. High prices uh, give incentives for other entrepreneurs to join in and take a cut of that profit, bringing the price down. If you put uh, in price controls, you take away uh, that incentive for short-term lowering of prices. Similarly, if strict net neutrality is enforced, the only way to provide better quality of experience would be to increase your capacity. And it might not always be possible to do so with space and technology and finance constraints. With such restrictions, network will be, able, will be able to provide access to fewer users with less profits. It is a lose-lose situation, which is why net neutrality only existing in a, is which is why net neutrality only exists in academia and and not in law. Over the years, networks have started using technology which isn't strictly neutral. Uh, but increases the efficiency of the network in terms of routing. Does anyone have any questions they can Awesome. Yes, uh, Shivam uh, is asking a question. I'll just unmute Shivam. Um, yes, Shivam, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Ask your question. Shivam, I've just Hello. unmuted you. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask, is it correct on the part of government to regulate, to create a level playing field like the free basic argument is going on? Uh, yeah, no, it's not correct because uh, there's never going to be a level playing field no matter how much we try because I mean, if you think about Google, uh, they have more computing power. I, I don't. I think only a few companies like Amazon can match Google's computing power, and uh, you know, Google has a lot of capital. It has the best engineers. Uh, Google has, uh, you know, uh, its own. In many cases, Google has its own backbone. I'll, I'll show that later on. Uh, so there is there is no doubt about it. Uh, the level playing field argument. Uh, assumes that government can, government is creating a playing field, but that is not true. Government interference is external. Uh, it's uh, the, the reality exists as it is, and the reality is that people have different capabilities and uh, different. Uh, they are standing in different 
levels. And and if, if someone is at a higher playing field and is able to provide a better service to the consumers, it makes no economic sense to bring him down to the level of others so that uh, you know he can so that they can be uh, uh, you know, some idea of perfect competition is implemented because then consumers will get a poorer quality product at a lower level fee, playing field. Uh, you know, the, the, you're taking away the advantage which you naturally have. So, uh, the level playing field argument uh, makes some uh, incorrect assumptions about competition. Uh, the the way people usually think about competition is that there is a you know uh, there's a there's a they think of it in terms of a game that there is some gambling table where people sit around. And, you know, there is a house that keeps a level playing field, and you know uh, everyone has to follow certain rules, and they, uh, there's a there's a competition on a level playing field. But uh, reality is not uh, that. When economists talk to talk about competition, we aren't talking about uh, competition that is specifically created. Uh, in, the, in the game of uh, gam in, the, in the game of uh, ga gambling, uh, the, comp the uh, risk factors are human created. We specifically make the game uh, more and more challenging. But in in the market, the risk factors are na naturally exist because we do not know what consumers want. And we don't know for sure, and we don't know for sure uh, what we can do to provide those uh, services to the consumers. So these are naturally existing. Uh, risks, uh, so there can be no uh, level playing field. Uh, for what, what the worst is that when government takes over the task of uh, level maintaining a level playing field, it has historically uh, cho chosen uh, winners and losers. It has uh, you know uh, it has uh, selectively applied these rules uh, for for uh, catering towards uh, well connected uh, industries. So yeah, that is my answer to that. Are there uh, any other questions? Please uh, post your questions in the questions pane, and I'll take them um, uh, for uh, Shashank to answer. All right, Shashank. Um, I think I think we can go ahead. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I hope everybody understood that there are two dimensions to. Uh, the net neutrality debate and the economics of uh, uh, your uh, your ISPs and how they appear uh, with one another. Anyway, so let's uh, continue. Uh, there are various reasons why uh, networks moved away from capacity on the approach towards managing their networks. Uh, they started facing problems because there is a high demand for internet usage. Uh, but you can increase your network capacity only so much. Secondly, they realize that not all bits are created equal and affect consumers' experience differently. There are problems in maintaining both application neutrality and destination neutrality. Let me take them up one by one. Uh, if you're playing a computer game or if you're on a, in a conference call, latency issues can make your experience quite worse. A game that lags a lot will become unplayable. A video streaming, uh, video streaming like YouTube is more latency tolerant as you can leave it to buffer. You can't leave a call or a game to buffer. They are live. On the other hand, you have emails and your uh, bit torrent. These applications are very latency tolerant. Uh, one second. Yeah, these applications applications are uh, very latency tolerant. If your web page opens a few seconds slower, it won't affect your experience the same way as a lag in voice call. It is not just latency, though packet loss affects... Uh, packet loss also affects different applications differently. No matter how important a data packet may be, uh, routers would always process their queue according to first uh, in first out principle. In a strictly neutral network, wire and games will compete with P2P traffic and lose in terms of consumer experience. Both these kinds of applications will receive the same preference, but conference calls will become much worse. Uh, so ISPs use deep packet inspection to figure out which traffic is P2P uh, like torrents and uh, 
Yes, and therefore they throttle it so that it doesn't affect the ex experience of other users by using latency intolerant applications. And if you remember, improving experience of networks and consumers uh, that connect to you is in your business interest. Naturally, this becomes uh, an arms race where P2P applications become more stealthy and ISPs keep moving, keep improving their inspecting algorithms to figure out traffic which needs throttling. A solution to this could be that if we simply allow ISPs to offer packs uh, depending on applications most used by the users, so they can offer you packs with guarantee certain experience related to either P2P applications or via applications. This way, depending on which user, which kind of user congests the network more, uh, will pay more for future increase in capacity. In a nutshell, the statement that all bits are created equal is false. It would have been true if all bits provide the same level of satisfaction to the uh, towards the experience of end users. But since this is not true, ISPs have to resort to different mechanisms to optimize consumer experience. Certain applications are time critical, so they need low latency. Certain applications are live, so packet needs to arrive in certain order, so they need low jitter from the network. These different uh, different bits are differently important to different people. No one's valuation is neutral, and this is true even for destination neutrality. I will get to that next. But to say that since we don't have a common answer for all networks, therefore ISP should be dumb pipes is to disregard possible optimizations to the network, especially local networks. Tier 1 and Tier 2 networks have huge capacities, but your local Tier 3 network doesn't. There's a huge incentive for your local ISP to analyze its traffic and optimize consumer experience. A lot of people say that uh, uh, they buy GPS connections, so they should have full right to that much bandwidth, uh, that they can do these optimizations at their home routers. But these optimizations at your home routers is not going to stop you from congesting the ISP network with P2P traffic. These optimizations will only work on people uh, with whom you share your home connection with. Uh, this is the problem with thinking that there is an ocean called internet and the ISPs provide direct connection to the internet and that internet works by magic after your bits leave your local ISP. Surely, uh, from a con consumer's perspective, this abstraction is helpful. But from policy making perspective, this abstraction could be disastrous for consumers. Moving on to destination neutrality, there is a similar vicious cycle existing uh, when it comes to uh, big content providers and local ISPs. Currently, content providers and end users only pay the ISP through which uh, they connect to the internet. So in the diagram, the content service provider, the CSP, uh, pays uh, the, the backbone ISP uh, for internet access. And the end users uh, pays to the access ISPs uh, to get access to the services. The CSP, the content service provider, doesn't pay anything to the access ISPs. For, uh, for the access ISPs in a neutral net, only the end users are a revenue stream. And that uh, has worked by and large in the past because we didn't have such big content providers. Uh, internet traffic keeps on increasing, so does the number of quality demanding services. To cover up for these services, ISPs invest heavily in their networks. Such investments are always lumpy and thus periodically cause an over-provisioning of bandwidth, which, however, is soon filled, uh, filled up again with new content. This is the vicious cycle that network operators are trying to escape from. While routing technology is constantly improving and cost per unit bandwidth is decreasing, it still remains a big problem that a lot of network optimizations and uh, expansions are caused by huge services. Content service providers benefit from the increased bandwidth of the consumer and customer access uh, networks, which enables them to offer even more bandwidth demanding services which in turn leads to recongestion of uh, the network uh, and, and a new need for architecture infrastructure improvements. It is easy to say that Access ISP should use money from its end users, but it might not always offset the cost. It might always not be, it might not always be economical to increase price, especially in a competitive environment. In such a case, if revenue stream 
could be opened up from large content providers to access ISPs, then the, then the problem is solved. In absence of any alternate revenue stream, the only way for an ISP to grow would be to charge large content providers whose users are mostly using the network for those services. Remember what I said in the previous slide, that not all bits, bits are created equal. Uh, when most of your users are demanding the traffic from certain services you routed uh, congestion free to them, they are no longer demanding net neutrality. They may not be demanding by the use of their voice, but rather by their choice in ISP. If an ISP optimizes its traffic from, for the most used services, that ISP will be quite sought after. ISP would be able to reinvest in its infrastructure. Users will get what they want. It doesn't seem like a bad idea. Usually people have apprehension against this concept because they think that ISP will become gatekeepers of their content. They will decide uh, which content will be fast tracked and which content uh, is not. From a very narrow perspective, that is true. If you look at the ISP, he's picking up winners and losers. But from a broader perspective, you can see that ISP is not making these decisions in a vacuum. They are influenced by consumer choice, uh, which, which uh, they can very well see from the traffic patterns. Imagine this, if Free Basics was released with, an unknown, with unknown websites, as free, and if Airtel Zero was released with most popular web, web, web services as free, which one do you think would the consumers opt for? From a broader perspective, ISPs are not picking winners and losers. Consumers are. As long as there is no coming to your home with guns to install free basics, uh, they are not picking the content uh, you will get to see. Uh, and in case of Airtel Zero and free basics, there is no discrimination in network regime at all. There is only discrimination in pricing regime. But even if there was, do you think the consumers would opt for an ISP which ultimately doesn't cater to their demands? <laughs> uh, believe it or not, the uh, present internet users have benefited from violations of net neutrality in the past. In the era before WhatsApp and Android phones, uh, we only had uh, BlackBerry phones, which were close to smartphones. And for multimedia messaging, a lot of people were using BlackBerry messengers. In those days, internet packs were so costly. Uh, so ISP started providing cheap BBM packages where you can pay one time only for access to B BlackBerry messenger. The cost of multimedia communication was drastically decreased. A lot of families got this internet messenger before they became so common today. Second uh, example is ISPs providing uh, free mailboxes. Try to remember the era before Gmail, before even Hotmail, there were no free email service service, uh, services available online. Uh, you were required to pay for those services. Many ISPs started providing free mailboxes to their consumers. This is not only a violation of net neutrality in the pricing regime dimension, but it is also an example of vertical integration. Yet this vertical integration provided the internet users with free mailboxes much before Hotmail and Gmail came along. Uh, this would be like if today ISPs offered you free Dropbox subscriptions. Maybe this even inspired others to think of other means to provide free mailboxes. Third example, many would not relate to, uh, but during the early days of the internet, it was too costly to play uh, massively multiplayer online games, uh, also called MMOs. And ISPs used to provide cheaper subscription to these games, uh, so ISPs have always experimented with pricing regime, and it is very much an important part of uh, business. It is no different than various products or services offering discounts of free samples. This is how ISPs differentiate themselves from one another. Today we have many of them trying to offer cheap WhatsApp plans, Wikipedia plans, and Twitter plans. Uh, and they are experimenting, trying to find out which services would get users on their network. They are not acting as gatekeepers. The better they are able to figure this out, the more profit they will make. So it is not that they are picking winners and losers. It is still the consumers who are doing that. As far as networking regime is concerned, I think we left neutrality behind as soon as we grew to be so asymmetrical. When internet started out, these problems were uh, not even imagined. But now we have large producers producing content for a large number of consumers. 
Similarly, the requirements of uh, the internet from the consumers is different now. They have certain preferences and expectations from services and applications they use. Large content providers who are consumed by these large number of uh, who are consumed by these large number of people have requirements which they are not which are not immediately uh, satisfied. They require network optimizations and upgrades. Uh, they require quality of service and content delivery networks. The current networking regime is therefore not capacity only. Uh, there's a quite a bit of optimizations and uh, management going on. ISPs are getting into prevention of spam and DDoS attacks. To stop DDoS attacks, you would have to break net neutrality, destination neutrality. There is such a thing as misusing the network. There are, there are now firewalls deployed by ISPs to protect their consumers from outside attack. The, the internet was born 30 years ago as DARPA project. It was meant for file transfers between universities. It was not engineered to carry out time sensitive voice and video calls. There are all sorts of protocols being developed and implemented which guarantee quality of services. Some of them interoperate between routers to dynamically reserve network resources so that low latency live communication is possible. InterServe works uh, that way. DiffServe provides different lanes for time sensitive traffic. Both, the, both of these violate strict net neutrality and we need, but we need quality of service. We already discussed how deep packet inspection is used to detect and then shape traffic so that user experience is optimized. It is needed to reduce the impact of heavy users using latency tolerant applications from affecting other users who might be using latency intolerant applications. CDNs are another counter example to general understanding of the internet. People usually think that big content providers uh, like Google connect to their uh, ISP backbone uh, and, and so do other content providers. The end user's ISP connects to its internet backbone, so Google gets the same preference as other content providers. Well, by and large, uh, while the data goes through the backbone, it is given the same preference. But nowadays, large content providers peer uh, directly with the access ISPs because their traffic is so huge that it would normally clog up the regular internet pipes. They also host static content inside uh, the ISP itself as a part of content delivery uh, service. This is so fast in opening up as compared to other websites. You could say that peering and CDNs are loopholes in the concept of net neutrality because they technically don't break it. After all, the data takes a different path and backbone routers aren't pri prioritizing traffic, but it does break net neutrality in principle. Of course, you need a lot of your own investment to make it work. Uh, which is why only big content providers like Google are able to do it. So what is wrong with uh, net neutrality? Uh, how did such an egalitarian sounding principle lose touch with reality? In a, nut in a nutshell, uh, they, they don't consider uh, internet service providing as an entrepreneurial activity as much as they consider application development as one. Well. That applications compete to provide best service is, is uh, to the end users as apparent, but that infrastructure providers compete too to provide best environment for these development for the development of these applications is ignored. It would be incorrect to assume that neutral environment is the most optimal environment to provide applications most demanded by the end users. If ISPs were completely blind and had no entrepreneurial ability, then net neutrality would make sense. Uh, for instance, if our country internet was run by a monopoly of government ISP whose entrepreneurial ability is highly suspect, the best option would be to let uh, government be this uh, neutral level playing field because a monopoly is devoid of being influenced by profit loss mechanism of the market. And any specific choice you can make would not uh, be susceptible to market correction. Net neutrality advocates assume that neutrality to be the end goal rather than consumer satisfaction. Their hypocrisy lies in the fact that they consider application developers competing for more and more consumer money as something to be celebrated, but not ISPs competing for more and more consumer money. And that it is plain evil. If, if application developers need to increase their profits to expand their business, so do ISPs. 
considering consider any LAN or private network, uh, it is quite common for network engineers to tamper with routing mechanisms, create fast lanes, etc., to optimize traffic in the network to minimize congestion. With no government or governmental order being imposed, private networks do not necessarily follow net neutrality, although they remain fairly neutral. However, why must this concept be restricted to private network? Why can't internet work towards optimization? Uh, even if no one believe, even if one believes that uh, no one owns the internet and therefore should not be allowed to tamper with it, he cannot assume that neutrality equals optimality. Can you really blame the ISPs for responding to consumer demand? On the other hand, the slogan "No one owns the internet" is highly misunderstood. Internet should be better understood as a concept. The idea of interconnected heterogeneous networks. The birth of internet was, was with this idea when researchers worked on creating protocols for compatible networks to communicate with one another. Internet is not owned because ideas cannot be owned, not because networks themselves are not owned. Obviously, networks are legally owned by both private and public parties. I hope Shall I have given sufficient argument. Yeah. Uh, I, I request you to quickly sum up uh, so that we can take a few questions before we finish. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like this is the last thing. I just have to. I'm summing it up. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. So, uh, sorry, I didn't tell you. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I hope I have given sufficient arguments to not consider arbitrary concept of neutrality to be basis of regulations. We saw that net neutrality debate had two dimensions, one related to the networking regime. Uh, and as we know, uh, that current networking regime is not strictly neutral. And that is not due to some nefarious intentions of ISPs towards world domination, but simply to satisfy the consumers in order to maximize profits. And that not that the point of, point of the market? Where business and business or vested interest matches consumer interest, a strict net neutrality in many ways would be a regression for the internet. As far as pricing regime is concerned, we saw that we saw that internet is no longer uh, symmetrical. There are large content providers serving large uh, serving data to large number of users. In many ways, the battle of net neutrality is a battle between large ISPs and big content providers. We also saw that uh, there have been non-neutral pricing schemes. That in the past uh, that have existed in the past and held in free zone, the internet kept functioning without any problem. It makes no sense to pick up pitchforks and form a mob against any ISP who, is, who experiments with in trying to get more users. I think uh, that is what competition is about. But uh, but uh, before we end, I would like to clear up uh, some doubt about uh, zero services. Uh, remember that zero services require more change in networking regime. They are purely a subset of pricing uh, regime, uh, which is not neutral, non-neutral. Uh, that itself should make this debate not about technical aspects of the internet, but economical aspects. Those arguments from technical backgrounds should should stop. This isn't going to fragment the internet in the way that the word is actually used in networking. There are multiple internet fragments being formed. Devices on zero plans. Uh, would still access uh, the internet through the usual TCP IP. Now coming to economical as aspects, uh, zero services are uh, not ISPs trying to shove services down your throat. They are not controlling uh, what you do on the internet any more than discounts control what you buy. Ultimately, you are going to uh, call, do cost benefit analysis and you are going to decide uh, if not having complete access, internet access is worth it for gaining, for getting certain services for free. Thirdly, uh, zero services do not reduce consumer choice. Consumer choice. Today, you can buy uh, so many different data plans, yeah, and if zero plans are allowed, you can still buy those plans. If uh, you are concerned that ISPs will control what the poor will get access to, uh, well, even if that is true, net neutrality alternative is even more condescending because uh, with net neutrality, you do decide what poor have access to. Nothing. Uh, he can make that decision uh, on his own. He, he doesn't need you for that. Trying to uh, trying out different pricing schemes and reaching marginal users is something that all businesses do, and that is how businesses expand. Uh, yes, they they are creating a world garden, but they are not shoving you into it. Facebook's free basic is a specific product which happens to violate net neutrality. 
do not confuse opposition to free basics as an opposition opposition to net neutrality. I agree with certain criticisms of free basics. For instance, I agree that naming it internet.org was highly misleading, but they have changed the name. I agree that certificate configuration makes them permanent man in the middle for HTTPS. But then if you're going to ban applications just because they are not secure, you will go on and endless chase and end up killing a lot of services. I agree that they need to be uh, completely transparent about charging users when they exit the walled garden. Transparency is a topic completely independent of neutrality. I believe that all ISPs should be transparent in informing users uh, what services they provide and what are their fair usage policies. These are arguments against fees basics and there are always going to, uh, going to be arguments against a service because no service is perfect. But these are not arguments for net neutrality. So to think that uh, Facebook is going to cartelize the, uh, you know, the internet is is to ignore that Indian ISV market is heavy, heavily competitive. Some people use the argument that uh, TV industry uh, was, uh, you know, TV industry is heavily cartelized because of lack of regulations. I think there is a. Uh, there's a MP which goes by the handle Rajiv underscore MP has made this argument in TRAI, his, his own TRAI paper. I think it is false and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's historical revisionism at, at its best. If you remember, TV started out as, a, you know, you only had the version and then slow states slowly and s very slowly started giving out licenses to more and more, uh, you know, you know, uh, channels and it only slowly deregulated because state does not trust spread of information. Uh, so uh, to say that, uh, you know, this will result in similar as TV cartelization, then that is wrong. Uh, there are a lot of licenses involved and uh, and it's, it's uh, uh, the TV industry is, cart is, is a cartel today because of regulations, not uh, despite regulations. In the end, I, should, I, would, I would just say that net neutrality has more social costs than social benefits, if any. And uh, if, you, if you're really into activism, I think your uh, concentration should better help if you are concentrating on spectrum allocation and how the government is not, uh, you know, is not deregulating spectrum ownership. It is only deregulating spectrum uh, usage, uh, but not ownership. Yeah, you and I can't go and own spectrum that easily. Uh, but they can, you know, they have deregulated somewhat uh, uh, spectrum sharing and spectrum trading, but that again is, uh, you know, only a small, small steps. Uh, we need a deregulation in spectrum ownership so that local networks are possible and, uh, you know, special mesh networks are possible. And, uh, you know, of course, mesh networks is another place where if you're an activist, you need to concentrate on, uh, because as I explained in uh, bargaining power, the more, more bargaining power we generate with our own networks, uh, the more, the lesser are our, uh, you know, the lesser is the charge that will be put upon us uh, by the ISP. Uh, that is, uh, I think that's all I wanted to say on this topic. Uh, if you have any more questions, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, thanks, Shashank. Uh, I'd like to ask the audience to post any questions that they might have, and I'll unmute them to ask their question. Uh, until... Uh, so yes, uh, Shiva has asked another question, um, and I'll unmute him so that he can ask it himself. Shiva, I have unmuted you. Now you have muted yourself. You need to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the gatekeeper argument against free basics. Yeah, what exactly? Uh, that uh, Facebook is trying to be uh, be the gatekeeper. Uh, that uh, you want me to rebut it again, or uh, you have a specific question? Yeah, I wanted to understand how it is being the gatekeeper. Uh, it is not being the gatekeeper in the sense. Uh, if you look from a narrow perspective, people only uh, you know usually look at the narrow perspective. Yes, it is being a gatekeeper. So if you are going to buy free basics on your device, uh, you know, not buy or opt for basically because it's free. So, but if you're going to opt for free basics on your device, of course, Facebook controls which websites you can access. But the question is, if you buy, if you if you opt for free basics, 
So you don't offer free basics. <laughs> they don't control uh, what you browse. Uh, but uh, and secondly, they say that you know the poor, they, they will still control who the poor will you know get access to. Well, I understand that if you're really poor and you can't afford uh, internet access uh, and you, you opt for free basics, you know, free basics will end up uh, controlling what you view. But consider the two things. That first, that there's going to be competition. Free basics is not going to be the only one providing uh, these kinds of plans. And secondly, that consider the alternative of passing net neutrality regulations. If you pass those net neutrality regulations, you have actually chosen for the person who's poor. Uh, you have actually chosen what he can access, which is nothing. He gets access to nothing. So the walled garden argument is, uh, is 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 correct from a very narrow perspective. From a but from a broader perspective, uh, we can see uh, that uh, Facebook doesn't pick uh, services blindly. It picks services which are in demand. And uh, the and and reliance is not, reliance in other networks are not picking up uh, free free basics because you know they want to create a world guard because but because they think that free basics is going to uh, provide access to services which are advertisable which pe which will get people to come on their network which is what they want so the world garden argument is uh, basically incorrect from a very broader perspective. Uh, from a wider perspective of the market, the world garden argument is uh, to 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 following this analogy. Of course, you know the uh, garden is walled, which a good garden isn't walled, but no one's shoving you into that garden. The world is uh, quite big outside it. Great. Uh, I have another question, Shank. Um, so we have Netflix coming uh, to India now, and it's 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 already in India and. Uh, what we've yeah. seen in the U.S. is that disproportionate traffic is used by users who, you know, use Netflix to as a television service provider. So, if net neutrality is imposed uh, by law in India, what uh, effects do you foresee for Netflix, the Netflix experience for the Indian audience? Well, uh, it depends on really uh, how much bandwidth you have actually bought from your ISP. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think the sky is falling either way. Uh, if these are passed, you know it's going to. Have, if net neutrality rules are passed, it's going to affect marginal users. Uh, and if it is not pa passed, it's going to help expand the internet. That that is the basic argument. I don't think the sky will fall. Uh, ISPs will still try to figure out how to increase capacity, and but they'll have to they'll figure it out at a slower rate. Uh, I mean, it, it may affect uh, internet penetration, uh, but. Uh, to have a very drastic effect, I don't think sky is falling either way. So that, that would be my answer. But but um, what would be the positive argument that what why I mean if can, can the case be made that uh, we will then, be, uh, Netflix, then, then then the Netflix service will be better off without net neutrality legislation. Well, you can look at it this way. I mean, the, the most common example is uh, Comcast in the United States, Comcast uh, blocking. Uh, Netflix, right? I mean, like throttling Netflix, not blocking it. So they throttle Netflix because then, because because of Netflix, they had to, you know, Netflix uh, uh, used up almost like like uh, uh, more than a quarter, one third of their, you know, network traffic, and it was really clogging up. And it was a service that uh, you know demanded a lot of optimization because it's a, you know, if you remember, it's it's somewhere in the middle of the uh, latency toleration uh, chart. So you know, I, I, the, the ISPs, as far as Netflix is concerned, they have to uh, provide a better service compared to you know just websites opening. Uh, as far as uh, Netflix is concerned, you can still provide it, but you'll have to increase your capacity to do so. It's not always uh, possible to increase capacity. It might not also also always be financial to increase capacity. So uh, you know, Comcast throttled. Uh, throttled the uh, traffic of Netflix, which I don't think would be that that common in here in India because uh, you know their Comcast was the only provider, so it had the you know uh, the audacity to throttle it. But uh, even after throttling, Netflix paid Comcast, and the speeds drastically uh, increased. Uh, and uh, this way, the users started uh, users of Netflix started getting uh, better speed. So. 
so you can you can think of it this way that uh, this whole thing this whole episode as hostile as it may be because of Comcast we have been the only provider there resulted in higher speeds for uh, the users hmm so if there is net neutrality then neither will Comcast be able to throttle uh, a content provider which is using disproportionate amount of bandwidth and nor will Netflix be able to pay an ISP in order to provide its customer yeah. a good experience. Yeah, I mean users usually say that you know uh, if you increase the uh, if you increase the capacity for a particular uh, for for a particular service, uh, you are you know there's a decrease that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that there's a decrease in uh, you know uh, there's a throttling involved. It doesn't necessarily. So people usually when I when I debate with people, they say that uh, you know uh, the com that Comcast increased the bandwidth. Uh, for uh, Netflix, therefore other people have slowed down, uh, other services have uh, slowed down. That is not a good argument. Reason being that my, most of the network capacity increase was triggered by uh, Netflix. It wasn't triggered by other services. Other services did not require such uh, you know, increase in capacity. So, uh, so there is also that. All right. Uh, I guess uh, we'll. But, uh, but I I don't think that the sky is falling uh, either way because you know Netflix is usually going to be opted by people who can usually pay a higher bandwidth and uh, uh, you know capacity wise they'll probably get uh, you know good enough experience so sky is not falling either way uh, but if if strict net neutrality is passed then you know it, it could be but. There is no indication of strict net neutrality in the past. I at TRA, I only asked about pricing regime, so which is quite different than you know networking regime. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll wait a couple more minutes uh, to see if there are any questions from the audience, uh, and yeah, if sure. not, then we can finish the session for today. Um, Uh, until then, I, I guess I have another question, um, Shashank. So, are, are you saying that um, Free Basics, Airtel Zero, all of these are essentially um, the content provider, which is Facebook in terms of Free Basics, just paying the internet service provider to provide a free service to the customer? Uh, is it? Is it? Is, is and and that's what. Um, Essentially, that is what the net neutrality proponents are opposing. That the, the your content uh, provider should not be able to pay for your pay for your experience because that's because the rest of the internet is paid for. You cannot, uh, you know, pay for customers uh, browsing your website. Well, uh, they are pointing out two things. They are, yeah, they are opposing that. So if you, if you remember this diagram that I showed, so your the basic idea of the internet is that you pay for access to your ISP and then you get access to the entire internet. and so does everyone else. And so it should be true for even for the content service providers. So content service providers pay for access to ISP platform. They should not need to pay for access to access to ISP access to the other ISPs who are connected to internet users. And this is also, uh, you know, this this is uh, true by and large. Uh, you, even if net neutrality is violated, it doesn't mean that there is going to be uh, ISPs blocking. There's a difference between blocking, throttling, and fast lanes. Uh, you know, uh, increase in uh, capacity of the uh, network doesn't necessarily mean that other other services are slowed down. So, yeah, their, their basic argument is that the, these content providers should not uh, pay. Uh, these uh, these access ISPs. Not only that, uh, that that is just pricing in the pricing regime direction, but in the networking regime directions, these access ISPs should not control uh, what users are accessing, uh, which content provider at which speed. I, I believe both of uh, those arguments are faulty. Of course, you can have extremes. You can say that uh, you know, uh, in the extreme, if you if you have an ISP, you say that I'm going to only allow access to Facebook.com. And that's the only ISP available for you. I think that would be really bad. But the question is that just because something can happen doesn't mean it will happen. How how probable is it that it will happen? That is the question, and I don't think it's very much 
uh, probable. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, various uh, social benefits of ha allowing these uh, kinds of uh, you know, uh, special zero packs and uh, special uh, wire packs or uh, you know, what's a low cost WhatsApp pack. I think there's a uh, benefit, very social benefit for that. Uh, again, I'm differentiating between throttling and uh, uh, fast lane, so the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so we don't have any more questions, Shashank, so I guess this we, we will end this session here. Um, and I, I just want to thank the audience for turning up today. I want to thank Shashank for uh, preparing this entire presentation and taking out time uh, from work to make sure the session happens. Uh, we really wanted a session on net neutrality and you know, uh, it's uh, Shashank has been really kind to put all this effort to make this happen. Thanks a lot, Shashank. Uh, uh, for your time yeah. and for your effort. Um, I hope uh, you guys turn up for the next webinar uh, on 26, which is on, which will probably be on um, the Constitution. Uh, it'll be on the on the public day, and yeah, I, I hope to see you, uh, see you then. Thanks, thanks a lot for joining. In.